and she splattered all over the canvas to create the glimmering effect. The level of artistry and creativity that went into those panels and into those canvases, I don't think you see that level of innovation here in American comics. And it's not, again, it's not a bad thing, but it's just a distinction that I have, you, like you can't help but notice it. Hi, I'm Robbie J. Atkinson, creator and writer of The Seven Kingdom, Fukushi no Okoku. You can find me on Instagram at the underscore seventh, that's number seven, T-H underscore kingdom, or on TikTok at The Seventh Kingdom. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual. I've loved manga and anime since, you know, I was young. And I'm still young at heart. Just don't worry about that. But I, the this particular creator is a very talented manga writer. Has an amazing team around each other uh, because they've created the Seventh Kingdom. And I'll let them pronounce the Japanese because my Japanese is horrible. We're joined by the ever-talented Robbie J. Atkinson. How are you doing today? I'm doing excellent. How about you? Doing good, doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. I am, gosh, I mean, I'm originally a filmmaker. I'm the owner of RPX Media Production. I, I write, I direct, I edit, and I decided to veer off into manga, into graphic novels. I have experience working in the film industry, working in the K-pop industry, working in TV, um, so I have, and I also have experience as a teacher because I did that for seven years. So I, I have a little bit of experience everywhere and, um, yes, I'm, I'm excited to be here. What's a manga that needs to be live action that you would like to be part of? Mm. Honestly, that this answer may surprise you, but I am not a fan of live action just because of the, the trauma they dealt with Dragon Ball Z years ago. <laughs> um, so really... If we were to see something come to life, I, I feel we've already seen Attack on Titan, but I'd like to see it redone and I'd like to see the uh, the graphics and the effects for it amped up even more because I feel that there was a level of um, intensity that the anime had that really could translate to a, a great big screen wonder, really. Very true. I, I thought Kenshin was really well done live action. I think that was something that was just like, I remember the anime and, and I read a bit of the manga and I'm just like, wow, like they actually were faithful with it. Now, yeah. One Piece sent from Netflix on the other end, eh, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Shh, we're not gonna say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but they're not going to cancel me. I'm not monetized, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, oh, there you have it. There you have it. When it comes to, of course, what you've created here with the Seventh Kingdom, and of course, your varying experiences, what is this manga about? And why did you want to create it? Why was the story important for you to tell? So this essentially is a story about a sheltered young woman who collides with very dark revelations as she goes on a, a very dangerous journey of revenge against uh, the Seventh Kingdom for destroying her village. And... In essence, this epic sci-fi fantasy action adventure um, was really created because um, I think that there is a upcoming generation. I think every generation has experienced this, but I am seeing with more recent generations that there's a slight mindset shift where we're recognizing um, the dysfunction in the world around us. And uh, I saw an article where I think it best summarizes the inspiration as the it was a counselor who said that when they cancel people in the 80s and the 90s the people asked them when will it get better will it get better and they said what scares them about these generations is they're not asking that they're saying it won't get better that's the level of cynicism that we've fallen into and i wanted to analyze a fictional world where people have fallen into a certain level of cynicism and acceptance of dysfunction and we have a protagonist who is discovering all of this for the first time and realizing it and having to go against the grain um really for their own personal agenda but things expand that much more for them and this is a series that has a lot of action, yes, it has underground themes that people would like, but it also has um, more profound and philosophical questions that I think generations to come will be able to appreciate because at some point everyone asks these questions. What's a philosophical question that you've asked yourself that you've actually solved? 
philosophical question that I have solved. Well, um, why do why is it considered the mature thing to dismiss a dysfunctional system or a situation or pattern as oh it's always been that way that's not my problem there's nothing you can do about it and i don't know if it suffices to say that it was solved but i realized that a lot of people answer that question with that dismiss that dismissive response and they justify it as logic and maturity because underneath that is really fear and cynicism and hopelessness, a sense that they don't feel that they can, they don't think that they have the capacity to make any kind of difference. And so they simply accept it or they make an excuse and say, oh, well, that's not my problem. But of course it is because when you have to deal with it, other people have to deal with it. Or when someone decides to accept it, you have to deal with it. Either way, it actually becomes everyone's problem. And that you see that in so many different areas of life, so many aspects of society where people have responded that way. Um, and when you have a problem with it or when you challenge that, you're told that you're just sensitive or you're told that you're just complaining, um, that you just need to toughen up or previous generations tolerated it. So why do you have a problem with it? And it, that's why we're here. That's the problem is it was tolerated before and it shouldn't it shouldn't have been. Does that make sense? So that is one thing that I did um, confront at some point. I think it's interesting because we, we all live through our own internal struggles and our own external struggles. <laughs> that matter depends on how far we want to go with it but i think it comes back to it's hard for people to ask for help i think that's one of the major reasons nowadays as to why people keep bottling things up and when they do ask for help like you said it becomes dismissive or it becomes to the point of why do i even bother asking if no one's even going to outreach the hand that i've already reached out for I, th I think that comes down to the sense of community and that comes down to the sense of um, communal power as well and when i say that i mean when you don't feel that you have a community that can help you, when you don't feel that you're surrounded by people who are willing to help, that really can be heartbreaking and that breaks a person's spirit, right? Um, and then if you have a community of people who don't believe that even trying to help would make a difference, then then you have this cycle that's perpetuated. So you have people who need help. They don't want to ask for help, but they ask anyways. Their help is rejected, it's dismissed because they had people who felt that their help wouldn't have made a difference. And you see the cycle that perpetuates. I always think back to this um, story. I forgot what town it was in South America where they'd had this bridge that was nearly broken. I mean, it was barely being held together by some string practically for like 40 years and they never fixed it. And so every year, these little kids would cross this bridge to go to school. And just about every year, at least once a month, if not more frequently, maybe less, the children would fall to their death because they fell off the bridge. And town just tolerated this. But the women who gave birth to these children, the mothers were like, no, we're not doing this anymore. And they all came together and they basically went on strike. And what had been a problem for 40 years was fixed in a week because of their decision to come together. And it's like, that, st that story to me, no matter how maybe vague, because I don't remember the names and the locations, no matter how um, maybe unfamiliar it may seem to people, it's incredibly powerful to me because it says that when everyone comes together and takes one step, one step, mountains can be moved, right? But it 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 comes down to mindset. And that is uh, mindset and, and I guess a willingness to work together, but that still comes back to mindset. Who's the people that are working with you on making this amazing comic, uh, manga? Yes. Um, so this company is called Tagline9, and this is a company that I have been working remotely with. Um, the The two founders, Ali and Walla, are actually based in two different countries, with Ali being in, um, I think, North Carolina, and then Walla actually being in the UK. And of course, there's another set of people behind them that helps with lettering and helps with other aspects, but I have not really interacted with that extension of the team. It's really been the two illustrators that I've worked most closely with. And they're just an incredibly talented group of people. And we, we like, I love their art style. I love their creativity. I love how they bring these characters to life, how um, they it, use their skills to, to create embodiment of these characters. And then likewise, they enjoy reading my scripts and, and they enjoy everything. So all around, everyone's enjoying the process and it's a lot of fun. So how does that transition from that story to your creative field of making this particular manga and of course, working with the team? Actually, it's funny. I was just talking with my illustrator and 
that translates to how we personify our main character, um, down to the, the the details of the colors of her outfit. Um, Mia's her character design takes from real world culture. So for example, Clara Belkeda, who's actually the one in the middle here, um, has a dress that is designed after Ethiopian traditional clothing, but the colors of her combat suit later on in the series are red, white, and black, with um, the red more or less representing um, in a symbolic way that she goes against the grain of society because typically your heroes don't always wear red now red you know red has there's a whole bunch to red uh, to color theory right as it relates to red but that theme finds its way in different aspects of the main character being designed in different dialogue and interactions with other characters um the world building um different things like that and i mean the team just has so much fun kind of bringing that to life um and kind of picking apart the little details of it because my illustrator saw it and instantly picked up on it was like oh I get it you did this because of that and you use this color because of that um and I was like ah yes that's right I think that's one example of how that bleeds in so what was the piece of artwork you got back that was way better than what was on your script there is actually so I actually have the the sneak a peek edition of my manga here um and the sneak a peek edition is just a, a preview of the series I'm going to show you the page spread so this is actually a page where um, the main character is being shot at by quote, quote, bodyguard or the bartender in the um, scene because she asked a dangerous question. She asked a no-no question. And this is his response, basically. And the detail in this double page spread, um, the way Walla and Ali drew in the expressions of the people um, right down here, the broken furniture, just the expression that they captured between like the people, the broken furniture, and then like this character overall kind of just spreading across the page with their, their firearms. Um, this scene came out so much better than I had even imagined. I did not envision this at all when I was writing the script, but in the sense of I didn't think of this kind of format. So this was just a great treat to see when Wall and Ali had brought this together. One of those images where I'm just like, just looking at the, the dynamic movement, because that's a dynamic motion. The shot goes across, it actually accents your framing of the page itself, which is incredible because I don't think people understand that it doesn't matter if it's comics or manga, if you have good framing on your page and you, you can follow it and it just accents what you're trying to do, especially with this type of action scene, it's unique, it's different, and it's not really seen too much because of all the effort it takes to not only draw the character, but to position it properly mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's a um a lot a great deal of creativity and i i try to encourage wall and ali too when we were in the process of really just so i went through a period of time where i studied other manga um really for stylistic reference to get an understanding because i'm understand that like as a filmmaker I'm I'm used to storyboarding and maybe I watch anime but like in terms of knowing a lot about manga itself I felt that I had a lot of ground to cover so I had a period of time where I did a bit of research I actually went to Tokyo and um, remember going to the bookstore buying the whole entertainment arc of Demon Slayer to look at the fight scene um, buying uh, Attack on Titan, buying some Sailor Moon um, volumes as well, just to see like these are three commercially very successful series and they all have a very distinct style, style. They all have a very distinct layout and different approach, different tone. Like what are some things that they do? And um, I remember looking at like the different types of panels, how the panels can be arranged, even how the panels can be framed. Like Sailor Moon um, during some moments has like these unusual like polka dots or square frames around certain panels. Um, and just like understanding how a character can be placed in the frame to make it unique or make it interesting. Um, like you said, to accent the action or the intensity of the emotion that's going on. And um, while I had my preferences and things that I specifically wanted, there are times when I gave Walla and it's a, a it's a personal um, a mentality of mine that people who work with me are co-collaborators and the goal is for us to challenge ourselves, but to also have fun because when they have fun with it, it looks even better than if they weren't having fun. And so um, how can we integrate all these creative elements and still have fun and still challenge ourselves? And Wall and Ali have always risen to the, to the plate every time. So it's been a real treat. Mm, three tools or resources. Um, I would say character annotations is the first one. And I've said this for a number of interviews just because character annotations are so important. You can't write your series if you don't know your character's personality. You don't know what drives them, what motivates them, what's their internal and external um, obstacle. If you don't know these things, you can't 
right. And if you do, it's going to be nothing but filler because you don't really, you're not really personifying them the way you originally intended to. So definitely character annotations. And that is a concept from film, directing actors. Um, man, that's another resource. Final Draft is a resource that I've used across film and manga. And honestly, I actually write my volumes in Final Draft. Um, I write them like scripts. And I actually see that Final Draft has a template designed specifically for comics, and I don't use it. I write it like it's an actual script um, because that allows me to include detail that is enough for Walla to look at and get a feel for the world while also creating a sense of pacing when have dialogue that's like back and forth and back and forth you have an understanding of the rapport versus dialogue and then an action then there's like a pause or there's like a sense of tone that's being set and then there's more dialogue it, it makes a difference and you pick up on it when it's written in that format um final draft also allows you to track pages it allows you to highlight it allows you to go and do a lot of things so for me final draft has been essential um and then i'd say maybe um the third resource um I would say, and, and this is this is more abstract, but really have a, a schedule for yourself as a creator, as a writer, um, where you have periods of work and then you have periods of rest. Um, some people, and I've, I'm hearing a lot of people have a mentality when they write, where they sit themselves down, they force themselves to write, bang their head against the wall, and they just force themselves to write as much and as much as much as possible. That, I mean, that's cool. If that works with you, it's fine. Um, but for me, I find that I write best when I write, when I have the inspiration, not when I force myself. But that's also because I'm someone who I am more disciplined with work than I am with rest. <laughs> so I have to have a schedule that kind of allows myself to work in ebbs and flows. And I have kind of my own little routine that I go through. So I'll go through a period of time where I write intensively and I'm producing basically. Then I switch gears and I go into a state of consumption. I go and I watch my set of favorite anime or maybe a new set of anime I've been interested in, take notes, look at screenshots, analyze the composition of the framing, like we said earlier. Uh, and you kind of end up working still, or sometimes you just relax and let yourself enjoy the storytelling process. It doesn't always have to be anime. It can be just a movie, but have that set of things ready so that you can produce and consume. And when you create, for me, when I create a balance between those two states, that's when I create the best. Top three anime that you can always rewatch and what are three anime that you want to watch? Mm. So top three that I can always watch. First one being Cowboy Bebop, uh, just because, I mean, we all know why. <laughs> but that was just a really great series. Um, there's so much. Keiko Nobumoto and the other people on the team, they did such a great job um, with so many elements of that. And I would also say, hmm, let me see, let me think. Outlaw Star was an overt inspiration for the series in terms of like um, the aesthetic and, and, and the world, the sci-fi setting. Um, but I would not say that that was a favorite. I, I would say Attack on Titan. I liked Attack on Titan. Now, a lot of people had problems with certain parts of it, and I understand. But like that aside, the way that series is told, the way the storytelling is set up, the way it builds your hope up and rips it from you, it's it's agonizing, but it's an enjoyable agonizing every time. Uh, I'll never forget when someone recommended that to me back in 2013. Um, and I was like, it couldn't be that good, right? And I ended up binge watching the whole of the episodes available like that night. <laughs> Hey, you know, we proceed to wait 10 years for the series to finish, but it was worth it, right? Uh, so that, so I'm kind of with you, Bob, Attack on Titan. And um, man, maybe, I would maybe say Inuyasha. Maybe Inuyasha, here's why, here's why. Inuyasha has very good storytelling and has a very interesting portrayal of character dynamics. Now, was Inuyasha annoying at times? Yes. Was I annoyed with him and Kikio? Yes. But that is how you know the story was well told, was these are not real people, but you're annoyed. You're you're eliciting an emotional reaction from this dynamic that has been created. And I feel that if you can accomplish that um, and, and build up complexity to the characters, that says a lot. Uh, I, I especially love Inuyasha for Sashomaru because of his character growth. Yeah. Um, so that's a whole other conversation. So those three, for sure. Um, and the three that I would like to watch, I've actually, oh, that's tough, you see, because 
if I if I see an anime I want to watch, I hunt it down and I watch it. So this is interesting. Um, I've already watched Kaiju number eight. I'm in the process of watching Fire Force right now. I just uh, I just finished watching Trigun, um, the original. Yeah, let me see what. God, I'm I'm in the middle of watching uh, Helsing right now too. <laughs> So, uh, what do I want to watch? What else? Um, I want to rewatch the original Roroni Kenshin, but I can't seem to find it anywhere. It's tough. I have, <laughs> this is how old I am. I have burned CDs back there of like pretty much all of the anime that I ever watched back in the 90s and 2000s. So it's there, even the original like Naruto and stuff like that as well. Like I'm an old, old school geek it is very difficult to find the kenshin stuff because as soon as they it got published the anime just disappeared like you had to find burned dvds basically to even find the last uh movie that they ever made of it which was still heartbreaking in itself just a heads up uh, i won't spoil it but still it was just it's a powerful series and i'm, I'm surprised they haven't done a re-release i'm surprised they haven't even even if they did like an hd upgrade just slightly i think it would just be people would gobble it up yes yes i i have seen i did peep the um the revamping of it because they like they when i say revamping it's like modern illustration style but the same story i did see the first episode of that but i i wanted that there's something about like the, that era of anime the, the visual style the coloring the creative process was a bit different so the texture and everything was also different and that's what i want i've not been able to find that Oh, what's another one? Um, gosh, I can't think of any more. I've, I've listed all the ones I wanted to watch and follow. I know someone recommended, I think it's called Zammed, which is X-A-M apostrophe D. Someone said it was interesting and on IMDb it got very high rating. So I've been wanting to see that. That's those only, only two I can think of, honestly. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice? Or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice you've received that has stuck with you in your various careers? Mm. Second best piece of advice. Um, you are only as good as your team. You are only as good as your team. And that does not just mean in terms of skill level, which that is very important um, because you can have one common denominator and change small elements of a team and get two vastly different results because of the skill level. But that also refers to the mindset of your team. If you have a vision, a aspiration, a goal, a height you'd like to achieve or accomplish, something you'd like to do, and your team is not on board with you, the likelihood that you will accomplish that goal is slim to none. And it's not because you don't have the capacity to, it's because you're not of one accord. When you have a team that you are not um, quote unquote equally yoked with, meaning like if you are not on the same page and you are not aspiring to the same thing, if you're not aspiring to the same level, it will slow you down or vice versa. If your team wants to accomplish something and you don't, you will slow them down and you can stunt their growth. And so it is very important as a creative, as a filmmaker, as a writer, in any capacity, in any career, when you choose to work with people, when you choose to come into partnership with anyone for any project, any collaboration, it is essential that you establish a sense of vision early on and know that we're all aiming for the moon. Because if you're aiming for the moon and they were settling with the grass, you hit the treetops, they will be content, but you will be frustrated and they will not understand why. And that dynamic can perpetuate into so many other problems farther down the road. You are only as good as your team. I'm curious here, because you've been in so many industries, how do you balance staying true to your creative vision while meeting audience expectations? I don't worry about audience expectations. <laughs> I don't know if it's a bad answer, but uh, it's, it's not like I don't create so that they can be happy. I create because it's fulfilling for me. I create because I have a story that I'd like to tell. And if you hone your craft enough, regardless of how different it is, people who can resonate with that will be drawn to it. Um, so really, it's just about staying true to yourself. Um, I think even when I worked in the K-pop industry and I, I did videography, promotional and marketing videography, I remember oftentimes they didn't, and I didn't realize 
because this was unusual, but they would kind of just say, hey, this is the artist, this is their music, come up with a promotion video. They never gave me like any kind of lookbook. They never gave me any kind of aesthetic, like nothing. And I would kind of look at the artists, look at their music, look at their previous music videos and say, okay, so this person kind of like how everything here is red. I would say, okay, this person likes red. So let's see if we can play around with red lights, red flashes and this, that, and the other. And the artists would love it. They'd absolutely love it. Um, so it was, and I mean, if if the team had a problem with it, they'd tell me and they'd say, hey, this looks a bit iffy or, hey, can you change that? And I'd just do it. It's fine because when you're doing work where you're being paid to meet their expectation, then of course you have to align with that somewhat. But even then I was given a certain level of creative agency that most editors are not. So my creative vision was something they just relied on um, when it came to filmmaking. When I shot uh, my short film last year, it was not about whether or not I'd meet people's expectations. It was about experimenting with the horror genre and pushing the boundaries as best as possible. Um, and for people who are really into horror genre, they would catch it. They would see it. And sure enough, I've I have had people who saw it. I had a um, Rotten Tomatoes critic who's been on the red carpet and interviewed Hollywood actors who loved it. She, she gave the award. She said it was the best horror of the year. Um, I've had other people look at it and say that it didn't feel scary or dangerous enough. Um, some people said some areas felt boring. And I just had to learn to stand grounded and firm enough in my vision to know, okay, there are, are maybe ways that you can make things translate better. Um, but at the end of the day, you still believe in your vision, your skill, and where you want to go, what you're trying to do. And if you're different, that's okay. Uh, that was something that took me years to accept, not in a creative sense, but as a person. If you're different, that's okay. Because it's not the cookie cutter that can go a certain distance. It's when you're revolutionarily weird because before you're cool and before people can accept it, you're gonna seem weird. When you look at any art form, that was typically the case, right? So that's how I've always looked at it. Yeah, it comes back to just having fun with it because if you're not having fun with it, why are you doing it? I mean, so I do DIT work for film and television and things like that and I produced and short films, et cetera. I'm actually working on a horror film locally here that's going to come out in horror is not my genre, but I can appreciate the psychology of, of a good film script. You know, it doesn't have to be bloody horror, but if you can understand character motivation, if you can understand the director's vision, if you can understand the um, you know, color theory and lighting, which I think is a, extremely critical in many aspects that people do not take full advantage of. And I'm glad that you're doing this in your manga. I'm glad that obviously with the K-pop industry, that's a very colorful industry in itself and film too. But I went back to school for visual arts and film from a 20 year IT career. So understanding color theory from an art perspective and then transitioning that into, into film was kind of eye-opening and freeing in the sense that it's not just about light and shadow, it's about what colors affect mood, what colors affect the scene. You know, you look at the purple of, say, the Joker versus, say, the colors used in La La Land, you know, it's just, it's incredible how it affects just the, the tone of a film or a particular scene. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and I mean, the colors, I talked earlier about how, like, the colors can personify characters more. You can use that to bring out a certain level of symbolism. There's so much room to play. Um, because I, fun, so fun fact, we have a character whose combat suit is actually, um, it's green. It's got a lot of green on it. And it's interesting because it was pointed out to me that, oh, typically green means good. But in this case, green is not good. And I was like, yes, that's true. But for me, I was thinking from the perspective of like green, when you see like, I don't know, a factory full of chemicals, what, what lighting do they typically use? It's green, right? Um, think of like Ghostbusters, uh, whenever something weird and kooky popped up, it was typically like some weird green light or something else, right? So it, there's so many interpretations for it and it allows so much room for expression. So I, I second that motion. What's a misconception about manga that people who don't follow manga misunderstand? Oh, um, that it's, it, I mean, well, okay, I will, I will say this. There is a lot of influence from Japanese culture in manga and that's a given but people don't understand exactly how much that permeates the things and the elements they put in manga and anime and 
I have actually been warned about, you know, like, oh, if you're going to advertise this to this group of people, just be mindful that they associate like this kind of hypersexualization, this really violent, glor uh, gory, bloody, um, they have a negative association with manga because of some of these elements. And I myself have actually, and I'm sure everyone has watched that one anime or um, read that one manga where it was like really pervy in different areas and it's kind of just a thing they do and so people assume that that is anime and manga people assume that that like that's a given that you're gonna have to get that at some point in it and I've even had people who um someone posted on threads and they're like what's the ick you have and I listed a number of things including like the hypersexualization and someone was like oh you don't sound like you're a devoted anime or manga fan for that to bother you and it was like oh no I am but I can still have that bother me because it doesn't have to be in there you can you can tell a good story and, and not have to incorporate certain elements and I think the conception that certain things that come over from i think japanese society bleed in and it's become a norm and that's okay right nothing's wrong with that because it's their culture they created it but that actually speaks to societal things at play for them that they don't overtly talk about it's just a thing you don't have to carry all of that over you can you can try something a bit different and people can still appreciate it think about jujutsu kaisen None of the characters are sexualized, but people love it, right? One thing for me about, about manga is, and it doesn't matter if it's Japanese or Chinese or Korean or whatever, because there's a huge, like, I, I think the fact that it's been, you know, different cultures in different areas, even though they're all from the Asian-centric area, in general, Philippines even for that matter, the fact that the different styles of art is, is really amazing. The, the fact that I think character development is way better than mm. when it comes to a manga series or it can be way better depends on how it's written because i think that if you can take when it comes to manga specifically i think that if you can write from each character's perspective and actually have cohesive storylines where whether they interact with the main character or not but if you can understand each of your characters in your collection i think that makes you a better storyteller and it makes your comic a little more long lasting when it comes to the, the longevity of what you're trying to create as as a whole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that goes back to the character annotations that I was talking about, um, understanding what motivates your character and understanding what, why they're driven, what stops them from moving forward, um, whether it be a internal or external thing. So I do agree that, um, I do feel that sometimes uh, the, the kind of storytelling, the mode of storytelling mm -hmm. is different in Asian, culture and we see that translated to manga and that is what makes it so someone said that they're they're a little more sentimental and they know how to bring that out in a way that um you don't see as often in like uh i would say even american like cinema mm. um, and that's why sometimes they'll try to make live action versions of uh you know right. so i do agree that is something i have observed as well also if they could just do away with the whole my two x specifically is it's like the over sexualization does occur it just seems too frequently, but maybe that's just what I happened to see at the time or read at the time. And then can we get away from the, the beach scenes? Like, I, I'm just, I'm tired of it already. Like, I get it, but come on. Like, really? <laughs> like, have a vacation, sure. I want to see them eat, like, ramen or something rather than just go to a beach. Like, <laughs> You know, you know what? Yes. And, you know, anime food is a whole separate, oh, yes. like, Hayao Miyazaki. I, I saw a montage of all the food he's had in his movies. and it's Beautiful beautiful absolutely beautiful so like yes if we had to switch them out i'd switch beach scenes and all of that for food which is funny because that is a thing in my series right. i do episodes food a lot so food <laughs> <laughs> now if you had the recipes of that food in the back of your mangas i would pick it up completely just saying you know what it's funny you say that that was something walla recommended doing like a little cookbook of um some of the food in the series hmm huh. That's what I did about 10, 15 years ago. I put together a web comics, what's cooking cookbook with about 60 creators from around the world. A lot of them have gone on to bigger things, working with Marvel, DC and other TV series and things like that. But way back when, when they first got started, create a comic and create a recipe for it. And I got some interesting family recipes too. And an original authentic eggnog from the civil, from the revolutionary war of the United States. Oh, interesting. The amount of rum in that is uh, pretty staggering. <laughs> just... <laughs> hey, you know, they had to add a little something in there to, uh, to soothe themselves with the time. That makes sense. Lots of rum. <laughs> I, 
I think if you do a, a collection or hardcover collection or softcover or whatever the case may be, just a cover collection, an anthology or whatever you're going to do for your series, how many exactly. volumes are you thinking for this? Um, oh, that's a hard question. I know there's going to be three seasons. Um, and I know that it's probably going to be at least 50 volumes in season one. I'm actually, I just finished volume 18 last night, actually, and I'm moving on to 19. So, wow. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. So yeah, a, a collection of your entire series have at least five to ten recipes per book at the back as a bonus feature uh, for stretch goals, and I think you are you're pretty much set. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna take note of that one. All right, challenge accepted. <laughs> Where can we actually get your book so that we can help support you yourself and your team? continue to make these amazing comics. Let's start with that. Yes. So if people visit rpxmediaproduction.com slash the seventh kingdom, and that's number seven TH kingdom, they will see the official webpage for the manga series. And there they can read the sneak a peek edition that's up on manga plus creators there they can also be notified they can sign up to um, be notified if the pre-order window is closed and they want to get like a shirt along with um, several nice posters and key rings and figurines other things if they want a nice um, bundle or different types of bundles they can choose from they can sign up there they can be notified if it's open they can go ahead and um, choose whatever package they want or um, they can actually go to our TikTok shop and they can just order the manga itself. Now, if they don't want to go on TikTok, they can go on Barnes and Noble, they can go to Apple Books, um, Rakuten Kobo and several more and they can get the ebook version as well. Um, and we're working on getting the physical versions available in those stores. So that's soon to come. What is your take on comics versus manga discords that always pops up on social media? I feel, like I said before, the American perspective of storytelling, being someone who had to study like American cinema and how even in American cinema, we studied French New Wave, we studied German Expressionism, we studied the influence of international cinemas. Every country has a distinct voice in way that they, they approach storytelling. Even with comics and manga, that is no exception in the sense that American comics uh, tend to, I've, I've heard a lot of people complain, they tend to be very wordy, whole big bubbles that take up half the page of dialogue. Um, and sometimes I think I saw, I forgot the terminology, but the, the way they use color sometimes is even a little bit differently because they'll use like one color to color a whole page age to bring out a certain emotion, right? Going back to color theory. Um, whereas with manga, uh, there are sometimes panels where there is no dialogue. And that was actually very off-putting to American audiences at first when they saw that. Um, I do see a distinction aside from just the left to right binding or the, the right to left reading. I do see that distinction. And I do feel that they are kind of, they're, they're both comics in a sense, but because of the cultural influence, the storytelling is different. And that is what brings out the beauty in both it's not necessarily a bad thing um but yeah i i think i personally appreciate manga because of ironically even though there's sometimes no color on the pages the level of creativity and craftsmanship that you see for example sailor moon i don't know if you've i like i went to the sailor moon museum when they had it in Roppongi, tokyo and i was actually by a man who was walking with people and he was talking to people about the different techniques that were used for because we were not allowed to take pictures there was an area where there were no cameras allowed like you put your phone away and um when i looked at the panels that were enlarged or even just like the canvases that she did you realize she used airbrush she took lace and she airbrushed around it she took she she put the canvas on almost like newspaper color type paper and she took white acrylic paint and she splattered all over the canvas to create the glimmering effect. The level of artistry and creativity that went into those panels and into those canvases, I don't think you see that level of innovation here in American comics. And it's not, again, it's not a bad thing, but it's just a distinction that I have, you, like you can't help but notice it. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Mm. My dad. My dad, um, he passed away in 2021, but um, he was actually a very avid comics lover, um, which is funny you mentioned Stan Lee because he was a huge Spider-Man fan 
huge to where it was a thing if i traveled abroad i always made it a point to bring him back something spider-man um i went to france and i found a vintage spider-man comic book cover written in french with spider-man against doc ock and i was like it's perfect because dad also loved doc ock but dad uh inspired me in that he he one taught me to embrace being unusual being different he said show the world something they've never seen before um, he, he encouraged me not to strive to copy people, especially in this age where you see a lot of, and it's not to say you can't get inspiration, but a lot of people right now, they know how to copy other people. They don't want to explore the unknown of their own imagination sometimes. And he very much encouraged me to do that. And I mean, he was someone who's just always an avid fan and supporter of like my writing. When I used to draw as a kid, um, film, music, all of the things that I've pulled together today to kind of use to drive my career. He was a huge fan of that. Um, and it wouldn't be fair to say just him. I'd say my mom, because my mom taught me about the grit aspect of it. You could have imagination, you can have creativity, but when you show your work to people and they try to stomp on it or they tell you it's not good or um, you go and try to sell some books and maybe you didn't make that many sales that day, mom taught me you hunker down and you keep going. You don't stop. Grit, that's it. And sometimes that is what distinguishes the people who fail and the people who succeed. And your mindset is really about failure too. How do you define failure? All of that. So, yes. From a professional standpoint, you of course have been in the film, K-pop, and manga industries, so you are very well versed in a variety of creativity. From a professional standpoint, you are a successful person, especially with the Seventh Kingdom here now. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Well, there is what other people see and there's what I see, and other people may say that I could be considered successful, but I know where I want to go. And that is what I use to gauge um, my sense of accomplishment. But here's the thing, even when I reach certain milestones, I'm always looking for something new. And you can be grateful for the growth that has been accomplished and the milestones that have been achieved while still being humble enough to know that you need to grow, you need to continue moving forward, you need to explore new ways to hone your craft. Um, so I guess my point is, you will never see me behave with a mindset of, oh, I've made it. It doesn't matter how much money I'm making. You can always get better. So even if I was making a certain amount of money, or even if other people would consider me successful, I would always say, this is the base of the mountain for me. And I can keep going. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures. How do you define failure? Um, I've had to learn over the years that failure is when you give up and you stop. It is failure is really equivalent to like death or synonymous with death. And by that, I mean, you stop growing and you stop learning. You stop moving basically when you're dead. Now there's a difference between resting and being dead. Resting is recouping. So there's still some kind of movement going on there. It's, it's just a, a recharging, right? Death is when there is no more mobility whatsoever. And to me, failure is not actually when you try something and you make a mistake. It's not when you spend money and the money doesn't come back to you. It's not when you try something and it doesn't work out. Um, it's it's really when you give up. And therefore, that, and that the reason why you have to look at it that way is because if you look at every mistake as a failure, then you stop trying. And that's when you really fail um, because you let fear take over you. So for me, failure is when you stop trying altogether. So long as you get back up and you keep moving, you didn't fail, you learned. And now when you try again, you're trying with a new context of knowledge that can be applied to help you succeed, um, to help you accomplish your goal. Failure is a mindset, not a state of being. Or as my mother says, I'll sleep when I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's in film, music videos, or manga, maybe you're inspiring them down that creative journey. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? By going back to what brings them joy and by one, not accepting misery, because the reason why I'm in this creative, creative field is because somewhere out there, I was working a job that I did not quite like. And I said, you know what? I don't want to accept this. How can I pivot more towards what brings me joy? And when you are in that space, then you say, okay, well, this is fun, but how can I make it more fun? And 
like I said before, you learn best when you're having fun. I found this in the education system. You learn best when you're having fun. You grow most when you're having fun. Finding the joy in your career, in what you do, allows you to shine in a way that when people see you, they say, wow, I want to do that too. And you can, but it's about finding your joy, going back to what brought you joy, being willing to sit down and dedicate yourself to it. And that dedication will look different for everybody. Um, but knowing what you're willing to accept and what you're not willing to accept in that process of finding that joy as well. Um, there's some things you kind of have to do just to survive, but how can you look with, how can you look at it with a, a mindset of, of, okay, this may seem impossible now. What's a step I can take right now that will make it in, um, more possible, I should say, right? So find your joy and stay on that journey. And even when it's sometimes it's not fun, even when it's a bit gritty, even when sometimes it's a bit tiresome, stick with it, but find ways to keep that element of joy with you in your craft and you will always shine. And that light will be seen by people that you don't even think are watching. If your life was a film or manga, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, this is tough. This is tough because I like so many different genres of music. I mean, it would probably sound sporadic because I, I love classical. I mean, I love, um, oh man, man, man. As, as someone who played the cello at some point for like 10 years of my life, I'm trying to think of um, a classical piece that we played because I love Tchaikovsky. I love Brahms. Um, I really love Ave Maria and in many different things. But then I equally am someone who loved EDM. And I loved marshmallow and like dubstep and and uh, funk and all. <laughs> That's so hard in terms of the soundtrack. It would probably be um I couldn't I couldn't say it would be one song. It'd probably be in a combination of songs that are all in the same key signature and all in the same tempo. And don't ask me what those songs are, but I think that's the best answer. That allows me to have this many, right? Um in terms of what would the title of it be? Um Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't want to say the cliche, but I, I'm at a point in my life where mindset has meant so much to me. And I'm seeing how mindset has kept some people stuck and mindset has also allowed people to accomplish things that um, others look at and wonder how. It sounds cliche, but maybe mind over matter. <laughs> sounds good. The reason yeah. why I asked the, the song choices is one, I need a new batch of music to listen to. So I'm going to be eventually putting together a playlist of everyone's suggestions. So, Oh, oh well, if that's the case, then um, <laughs> I would say that. Let me see. Well, it depends. If you are someone who's into a little more of like a, um, it's like a more modern house slash chill wave slash, um, Funk, I'm thinking 53 Thieves. They're, they've got a very cool vibe. Um, let me see who else. If you are looking for a little more EDM, I tend to like anything that is Seven Lines Remix, but I really love the Seven Lines Remix of Cosmic Love. It's very beautiful. As someone who always wanted to play the harp, it's very, very, it takes a certain element of the song sung by Florence and the Machine, and it actually puts it at the very beginning. And when I hear it, every time I hear it, it reminds me of stars. It's so beautiful. Um, and maybe my third recommendation, if you want to get more into, um, classical music, if, if you're looking for something that's a little more spunky, you know, not something that'll put you to sleep. Um, it depends if you want something a little more, uh, more ominous and very immersive, I would say Hymn of the Cherubim. I think that was Tchaikovsky. I'd also recommend, um, oh, Lacrimosa, everyone knows Lacrimosa, so I don't know. If you want to sound, if you want to wake up and feel like a, a, a super villain, then listen to Lacrimosa. <laughs> um, what's another? Oh man, there there's a song I like. Dun 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 dun. The name escapes me. It's like a number, it's like a two number three and e, e flat, something like that. So when I find it, I'll let you know. But before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, anything else you would like to promote with yourself and of course your amazing. Uh, creativity. Yes. Yeah, so if people want to follow me, I do have a public account on Instagram. It's underscore um, Godzilla, but it's G-O-D-S-C-I-L-L-A underscore nine. There's a long story behind that title. Um, 
And that is where you can see updates on my film work, updates on the manga, updates on my nonprofit activity, if you want to see that as well. Um, I would encourage people um, to come out to Anime Weekend Atlanta uh, for anyone who is able to, highly recommend it. We will be offering um, perk packages where you can order the bundle that I mentioned with the shirts and posters. We'll also have really cool stickers. We'll have really cool um, key rings. Um, and we'll actually be revealing Claire Belkada's combat suit um, in addition to one mystery character's combat suit and then two additional characters were coming up in um, upcoming volumes. So there's a lot in store. And if you do show up, you can actually get a chance to get our secret page token where you can do an online scavenger hunt. So that's going to be unique to each volume that will give you um, cover art reveals, character reveals, or um, just inside information, fun facts about the series. So definitely come on out. That's going to be in December, 12th through the 15th. Well, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and 1,200 plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O. Go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. Of course, you can find the podcast at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say, every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.